Morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, Jeff. So this morning, um, we have a presentation on the ocular surface by Dr. Michael Duffin um, from the Moran Eye Center. And uh, that should be the only presentation. So welcome. Good morning. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the ocular surface, but narrow the topic to uh, talking mostly about dry eye disease, uh, uh, practical approach and treatment to that. Um, my wife and I were missionaries in Panama between 2004 and 2007. We noticed down there our eyes didn't give us any trouble at all, but when we came back to Salt Lake City a few years ago, all of a sudden, at least my eyes began to burn and sting a lot, and I started thinking, you know, I haven't paid a lot of attention with my dry eye patients to um, uh, humidification and control of the environment, and I started paying more attention to that and found that it actually did work a little bit. This is us a few years ago in the San Blas Islands, 95% uh, humidity and uh, or more like 100% humidity and 95 degrees uh, all year round. Dry eye disease, as all of you know, is a very prevalent condition and about five million adults in this country have it, preponderance of, of women. The cost of dry eye disease is significant. It was estimated in a recent study uh, published a few months ago in the Cornea Journal that the cost to the patient, direct cost with copay and uh, coinsurance was um, about $800 a year. And if you look at the total cost, uh, what insurance companies pay, the government pays, and even loss to employers approaching eleven or twelve thousand dollars a year so the financial burden is significant no matter what specialty or subspecialty we happen to be in in ophthalmology we're finding that it's more important now than we used to realize before to pay attention to the ocular surface particularly with uh, refractive surgeons uh, premium IOLs but oculoplastic surgeons of course have to pay a lot of attention to the ocular surface with blink abnormalities retina surgeons with uh, neurotrophic keratopathy with diabetics and um, certainly glaucoma specialists with the amount of topical medications and preservatives that are placed on the eye. We all know that it's a multifactorial problem with uh, pharmacology, neurology, um, allergy, immunology, uh, blepharitis, infections, trauma, all kinds of different factors can have an effect on the ocular surface and dry eye. I've come to realize, especially after coming to Salt Lake, where it's much drier than even in the desert where I practice in Southern California, that I was really quite weak in my approach to dry disease in my patients in California. One of the weaknesses I had was taking uh, an incomplete history, not really talking to the patient about their lifestyle. Failure really to look at the whole patient, maybe not noticing their face that they had rosacea, or looking at their hands to see that they had rheumatoid arthritis. Um, sometimes we have um, the weakness of just approaching everybody that says my eyes burn and sting and giving them artificial tears instead of looking at some other modalities that may be more helpful. And failure to address the basic cause of dry eye and not educating our patients correctly. In 1946, Eugene Wolfe um, put forth the um, the theory of the three separate layers of the tear film, the lipid, the aqueous, and the uh, mucus layer. And later in 1965, Ehlers noted that these three separate layers actually worked in unison when uh, pressure was placed on the lower eyelid. It seemed, the tear film seemed to move on block. A few years ago in, in uh, Australia, Ivan Scher coined the term dacrolon, uh, which emphasized the integrated body of the tear film. And here's a, um, an illustration from his paper which shows um, the uh, intrapalpebral tear film and the retropalpebral tear film, which uh, probably does not contain much, if any, lipid concentration. Here on the, on the right in this diagram, we see the corneal epithelium. And immediately adjacent to the corneal epithelium, we have a glycocalyx, which is a slippery layer of um, uh, glycoproteins that um, decrease the friction when we blink. That's secreted by the corneal epithelial cells. Then immediately to the left of that, we have the mucin layer, the aqueous layer, and then the lipid layer here to the left. 
What we've learned in, in recent years is that the aqueous and the mucin layer are not completely separate. It's actually called the mucoaqueous layer now because the mucin molecules are interspersed in the aqueous layer with a concentration that decreases as we go toward the external tear film. Stephen Flugfelder and others have popularized the notion of the lacrimal functional unit, recognizing that the tear glands don't act um, in an isolated manner, but are linked together with the neural network and the ocular surface to work together as, uh, as a unit. And this will have an effect, as we'll see, both in the pathology as well as the normal physiology of the tear film. There's been a lot of different terms that have, uh, that have been used in the literature to describe uh, dry eye disease. One of the uh, terms that was popularized, I believe, by the Delphi panel a few years ago was dysfunctional tear syndrome, which doesn't use the term dry eye. That terminology has not really caught on because dry eye, the term dry eye is so ingrained in the literature. But the rationale for using dysfunctional tear syndrome is to recognize that not all tear film abnormalities are dry eye. But um, as we read the recent literature, the most common term is either dry eye disease or dry eye syndrome currently in the literature. There have been several attempts to define and classify dry eye. One of the main ones a few years ago, which was published in Corny in 2006, was the Delphi panel. Now, the Delphi panel is simply a consensus of experts. There are 17 uh, external disease experts who are brought together to try to classify and define what dry eye is. And they concluded that the terms that we've used in the past and still use, aqueous deficiency, dry eye, and evaporative dry eye, are really inadequate because they seem to imply there's two separate categories when really they're not. Most of our patients have a combination of evaporative and aqueous deficient dry eye. Most cases of significant dry eye will have an, inf an inflammatory basis. Diagnostic tests such as the Schirmer test uh, have limitations and they proposed a stage classification which will help to direct treatment. A year or two after that, the, in the Ocular Surface Journal, the, uh, the Dry Eye Workshop Study, the DOES study, was published. And in this study, a, a definition was put forward stating that dry eye is a multifactorial disease consisting of uh, symptoms, visual disturbance, instability of the tear film. And then they used two terms. One is increased osmolarity, hyperosmolarity, and inflammation which um, help us to understand the pathophysiology of dry eye syndrome. <coughs> there are many anatomic and physiologic factors that impact dry eye, whether it be uh, decreased blinking, ectropion, uh, decrease in aqueous tear production, meibomian gland health, corneal epithelial health, uh, neurotrophic keratopathy, and immune system. In addition to these factors, there are many other factors such as age, gender, hormonal changes, uh, pharmacology, vitamin A deficiency, et cetera, that many of these will take their effect through a common pathway to destabilize the tear film, causing hyperosmolarity, damage to the ocular surface, and discomfort. We're all aware of many lifestyle uh, factors that affect dry eye. There's actually a syndrome called computer eye syndrome. And it's amazing how many patients we'll see today that we ask them, how many hours a day do you spend on the computer? They'll say eight, 10, sometimes 12 hours on the computer. And it's been shown in several studies that ha that has an effect in exacerbating the symptoms. Long commutes in the car, especially if, if people have the vent uh, directed toward their face, uh, airplane flights and other environmental, recreational and occupational factors, and perhaps even diet may play a role, as we'll see in a minute. There are many clinical tests for dry eye. Um, I don't do the Schirmer test near as much as I used to in the past. It doesn't correlate, uh, it's not as reproducible, it doesn't correlate with uh, the symptoms, it's not as helpful as other tests such as um, the tear breakup time or corneal epithelial staining. So generally, um, in a busy clinic, it's very helpful to put a drop of fluorescein in the eye. Technically, if a person is doing research, they should 
quantify the volume and the concentration of fluorescein, maybe 50 microliters or 2% fluorescein. But I in practice, it uh, is not really that practical to do. So a little drop of fluorescein in the eye, and one can track epithelial staining, although it's best to wait uh, three or four minutes if you can do that, because sometimes epithelial staining will not be present within 10 or 15 seconds, but, but might show up after a, a minute or two or even four or five minutes. Um, we can also check the tear meniscus with the fluorescein stain, and then of course check tear breakup time. Other tests such as tear osmolarity and impression cytology are primarily reserved for research applications. So vital dye staining, besides fluorescein, we have rose bengal and lysamine green. Uh, fluorescein will stain, of course, corneal epithelial defects and defects in the tight junctions, whereas rose bengal and lysamine green both uh, will stain devitalized epithelial cells, even though there are no defects, and also areas where the mucin layer is deficient. Rose Bengal will sting quite a bit. Lysamine green stings a little bit less than that. And Rose Bengal and Lysamine green are better for staining conjunctiva. Here we see Lysamine green here on the lower right, whereas the fluorescein is better for staining um, the corneal epithelium. Um, a study by a Korean group in this month's issue of cornea um, reported their results in actually combining lysamine green with topical fluorescein to stain both at the same time. Uh, their conclusions were not really that surprising. These are not photos from the study, but they saw both corneal epithelial staining as well as conjunctival staining and concluded that um, symptoms were better correlated with conjunctival staining for some reason, whereas corneal staining correlated better with the tear breakup time. The tear breakup time, um, consists of simply putting fluorescein in the eye, asking the patient to blink a few times, and then having, using the cobalt blue filter, having them uh, stare straight ahead without blinking, and checking to see how long it takes to see the fluorescein layer begin to break up. This presumably is due to the lipid layer, the outer lipid layer becoming disrupted, which allows the mucoaqueous layer to begin to evaporate. Now, the, the um, uh, patients generally will blink every few seconds, maybe every five to ten seconds. If the tear breakup time is sooner than the, the blink rate, then there's a problem with the evaporation leading to uh, symptoms. If the breakup time is longer than the uh, inter blink interval, then uh, there shouldn't be as much problem. Irregular light reflex can also be seen at the slit lamp. And here's a, a photo uh, post-LASIK patient showing some epithelial changes, which are quite common, especially in the lower cornea after LASIK. I don't know if this uh, instrument is available yet. Does anybody know if the, the hyper, uh, the, the tear lab instrument for measuring <coughs> osmolarity is available? Did they? Okay. I haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but I believe it, run, it costs about $6,000, and the kit is about 40 or $50 for measuring the osmolarity of the tear. And this uh, holds a lot of promise because it, it could be a very good marker for helping with dry eye studies with, with new medications and clinical trials that are, that are coming, um, uh, coming forward to help us to better evaluate the efficacy of medications. Yes. Yeah, well, uh, basically, if the patient's symptomatic, I think it's perfectly reasonable to treat to treat them anyway. We'll treat them at least with artificial tears and see. That certainly wouldn't hurt anything. Yeah. Yeah. If um, if you if you. Yeah, really why do the test? I, tol I totally agree. Very expensive test, um, uh, and uh, really what's it going to add? Yeah, because in, in, the, in the final analysis, we're basically going to treat symptoms and signs anyway, and probably not pay a lot of attention to whatever the osmol out. So I think primarily this probably will help in as a research tool to, um, 
um, to, to help in research studies because it can be a marker for, because it's, it's, well, uh, under, it's, it's well accepted, generally accepted that hyperosmolarity is correlated with the pathology in, in dry disease. <coughs> Um, we all know that dry disease can affect the visual acuity. This hasn't always been well understood. Uh, the reason, most likely, is because the, the differences in the refractive indices between air and uh, the liquid of the tears is greatest at that uh, transition interface than it is in any other transition interface in the ocular system. Um, there are also studies showing opaque corneal epithelial cells by confocal microscopy and other pathology that could occur. Certainly when you look at a, uh, a light reflex such as this here below, it's, it's easy to see why visual acuity could be affected. A study a couple of years ago in the Ocular Surface Journal um, by an optometrist um, uh, addressed the correlation or lack of correlation sometimes between signs and symptoms. He concluded that generally there's a positive relationship between the amount of si the severity of the signs and the severity of the symptoms, but uh, the association is is always is not always that strong. And he found that higher correlations actually exist among questionnaires than among objective tests. What causes symptoms in dry eye? Um, most likely, it's due to uh, irritation or stimulation of corneal nerves either due to uh, the cytokines, hyperosmolarity, pH changes, or, or trauma. And we've all seen patients that come in with symptoms, but we don't see anything wrong on the examination, or have uh, significant signs on the examination, but not really complaining very much. The former here on the left, symptoms without signs, uh, can be a little perplexing. We wonder if we just have a complaining patient, but it may be a, just a hypersensitive eye. Um, there was a study by Belmonte that uh, postulated that in some cases there may be a microneuroma or something wrong with one or more nerves that could be causing some pain in the absence of any visible symptoms on the ocular surface. The a scenario of signs without symptoms is more dangerous um, in our situation because if you have somebody with neurotrophic keratopathy, they can have significant problems, even corneal melts. Uh, uh, impending perforations with very little symptoms and may not even come to see us. And so um, it's always important to take a careful look at the ocular surface, especially before surgery, even if a person is not complaining of dry eye symptoms. There are several entities that can masquerade uh, as dry eye disease with similar symptoms, such as blepharitis, particularly posterior blepharitis, and conjunctival chalasis, which uh, I know that I have not paid much attention to in the past and probably still miss a lot of cases. Most of our older patients will have redundant conjunctiva, especially in the lateral portion just over the, above the uh, lower eyelid. And the symptom, the main symptom of conjunctival cholesis is a burning or a stinging sensation, a fleeting stinging sensation when they blink. So during the blink mechanism, if it stings then and after when they're not blinking, it doesn't sting. That could be conjunctival cholesis. It's pr probably due to the redundant conjunctiva being um, moved across the ocular surface, especially with a deficient ocular tear film, which will cause friction and stimulation of corneal nerves. This can be treated uh, generally pretty well with um, artificial tears. Some uh, people have um, used procedures such as cautery, uh, conjunctival resections, to tighten the conjunctiva with some good results. <coughs> so as we look at the pathophysiology of dry eye, what, what was actually happening on the ocular surface, what is the cause? Hyperosmolarity is the main driving force. That leads to activation of various uh, inflammatory cytokines that in turn will cause goblet cell reduction, loss of mucin, on the ocular surface and epithelial damage and apoptosis. This will destabilize the tear film, which in turn exacerbates the tear hyperosmolarity, lead leading to a vicious cycle. These core mechanisms are a driving force. This uh, diagram taken from the Dews report are a driving force that will stimulate the nerves and initially in the early stages increase the reflex drive to the lacrimal gland, increasing aqueous production. However, with the passage of time, nerve injury can occur in chronic dry eye, which will lead to a reflex block, which decreases 
proteins production. Um, and that will lead to worsening of the hyperosmolarity. Now, also as we look at the eyelids with meibomian gland dysfunction, decreased fil lipid film layer from meibomian gland dysfunction, which leads to increased evaporation, especially with environmental uh, changes, dry air and low humidity, which will lead to high evaporation and increased hyperosmolarity. And other factors we see here on the periphery, surgery, uh, the aging process, low androgens, which accounts for the fact that the predominant, um, the, the, the majority of people that have dry eye are women, and other factors, systemic drugs such as antihistamines, uh, estrogen replacement in postmenopausal women, and other factors which will exacerbate this condition. So we see a disruption of the mucin layer here with goblet cell loss, a decrease in the aqueous layer by reflux block of the lacrimal gland, and a de decrease in the lipid layer from meibomian gland dysfunction, which are the pathophysiologic uh, elements that drive um, the dry eye disease pathology. <coughs> meibomian gland dysfunction is not necessarily synonymous with posterior blepharitis, but it consists of hyperviscous uh, secretions in the meibomian glands, leading to an inadequate tear lipid layer, and bacterial lipases can act on the, um, the secretions, the waxes and esters, to um, uh, convert them to triglycerides and fatty acids, which will lead to a saponification process and little micro bubbles or froth that we can see along the eyelid margin. And that is considered to be pathognomonic when we see that froth at the slit lamp on the eyelid margin, pathognomonic of bacterial growth or perhaps uh, some antibiotic uh, ointment on the eyelid margin that might, might be beneficial. An article last year in Cornea uh, entitled Non-Obvious Obstructive Meibomian Gland Dysfunction uh, presented several cases where uh, there was no obvious inflammation, there was no obvious uh, whitish secretions from the meibomian gland orifices. And one on initial inspection might say, well, the eyelids look fine. There's no posterior blepharitis. The only way to diagnose this non-obvious MGD would be to try to express the mibum from the glands. And if one tries to do that, they can see that the glands, at least some of the glands, are obstructed. And that can lead to the same problems with decreased lipid layer and evaporative dry eye. So even though we probably don't generally, at least I don't uh, routinely try to express, sometimes at the slit lamp we can certainly uh, put some digital pressure on the, on the eyelids just to see what happens um, with the mibum of the orifice to see if there is obstruction. The treatment uh, for meibomian gland dysfunction is well known, starting with warm compresses. The warm compresses probably should be kept on the eye for at least four or five minutes to really be effective. It's thought that one or two minutes is not sufficient. Um, if you really talk to your patients about this, compliance is probably very low. Most people, I mean, I don't know how many of you have tried to do warm compresses. It's not the easiest thing or funnest thing to do. You're tired, want to go to bed, and putting warm compress on your eye. People probably don't do this as much as we would hope they would. But uh, following the warm compress, eyelid massage and expression of the, uh, the uh, secretions, uh, lid margin hygiene is needed, antibiotic application we've talked about. Now oral doxycycline can probably be used in doses lower than what we've been accustomed to in the past. For example, 100 milligrams BID, a maximal dose, is, is often not needed. In fact, even 20 to 50 milligrams of doxycycline a day or BID uh, can be a very good maintenance dose for many patients. We'll talk in just a minute about the possible benefit of uh, dietary <coughs> omega-3 supplements, uh, topical azocyte, and also meibomian gland probing. Um, we can teach our patients how to digitally massage the meibomian gland, the, the eyelids after uh, hot compresses to help express some of the secretions and then clean them off with an eye scrub pad or with the washcloth itself. In the office, we can uh, express uh, the meibomian glands uh, secretions such as this. And this is a, a picture showing the mistrata paddle, which is just an instrument that can be used to do the same thing. <coughs> and then Tear Science has produced this instrument. I'm not sure if this is available at 
yet, but it's called lipoflow, where if you look here at this diagram, um, and I'm not sure I'd want to have one of these put in my eye, but <laughs> uh, good luck trying to talk your patients into, into volunteering for this, but um, the internal aspect that goes again, there's a corneal protector, and then an internal warmer that heats up the adjacent to the meibomian glands, heats up the, the glands, and then a, an eye cup on the outside that puts external pressure on the eye, eye, eyelids, expressing both the upper and lower eyelid at the same time. Now the question uh, comes, comes up, does it really do any good to try to express meibomian glands? This uh, article from last month's issue of cornea by R. Cienega, um, they it did baseline studies of tear evaporation rates. And then they looked at evaporation rates both in a relatively dry and a relatively, relatively humid environment and uh, looked at it at about six minutes, 12 minutes, and 24 minutes. And they found that the tear evaporation rates did decrease at the six and 12, 12 minute marks, but at 24 minutes, there was really no uh, change at all in the evaporation rate. So from this study anyway, there's not, a, we wouldn't expect a lasting effect by expressing meibomian glands in the office. One of the reasons for that is that if you have a completely occluded gland, which many of our pa older patients do, expressing is not going to do a bit of good for that. So that leads us to uh, Steve Maskin's um, procedure that he presented at Arvo uh, two and a half years ago, meibomian duct probing, which seemed rather barbaric at the time. Who would want to have little needles or probes stuck into their eyelids 20 times? But um, his results were ver really very good, have been reproduced by others, at least anecdotally. Um, the rationale behind probing the ducts is that they can be obstructed. There can be obstruction of the orifices by surface metaplasia. There can be fibrotic destruction and myvin plugs within the glands themselves. And these probes are currently available through Rhine Medical. Um, Maskin published his studies a year ago in cornea. Um, 25 patients were treated. Um, just about all of them reported immediate improvement in the symptoms, and all of them had symptomatic relief at four weeks. And this seemed to, the symptomatic relief seemed to last with 80% of them within, um, within a year, for a year. So this um, actually going in and probing the gland can be much more longer, longer lasting than the expression. Paula? Is there a way to probe the gland? No, no. Yeah, and that probably would be a little difficult to, I see a, a sham probing just being, uh, going through the procedure but not actually probing. Yeah, he did, I don't think he did that. Right. Right. That's a good. I I've been doing this in a few cases over the last year, and I've noticed that um, we do one eye first, and every patient except for one that I've done immediately notices an improvement. But a lot of that could be placebo effect, also. Yeah. So it's really hard to tell. Hard to. I think it might be a little hard to do a do a control, but. I don't, he didn't do that in this particular study. This is a video. Begin by passing a two millimeter probe through the orifice. You may need a fine router movement to find the opening, especially in the setting of orifice metaplasia. If epithelium has grown across the orifice, the probe may still be able to pierce through. If not, then topical lidocaine may be used to de-epithelize the orifice. If the orifice is scarred, you may be able to penetrate by cutting the tip with a barred Parker blade Cut it on an angle to achieve a more pointed tip. Be sure to visualize the gland before attempting to penetrate an orifice to avoid the completely atrophic, non-existent gland. So the first patient I did with this last year, um, he had probably 75% of his glands I couldn't even enter. They were he was, it was a very advanced case, and either because of surface metaplasia or fibrosis within the gland, and maybe my inexperience, I just couldn't get in most of the glands, and he didn't notice any improvement. But Subsequent patients have, I've only done three or four, but they've all noticed some symptomatic improvement. And every single one of them has noticed improvement uh, uh, on the treated eye versus the control, versus the eye that wasn't treated, but of course that could be placebo. Um, the, these probes come in two, four, and six millimeter lengths, and generally the two millimeter is sufficient to 
relieve the symptoms and what's, what's happened before. Um, anecdotally, uh, in going to meetings and talking to people across the country, there's several uh, ophthalmologists that are doing this at the present time. I'm not aware of any other published study yet. Maybe somebody else is, but time will tell whether this is really beneficial or not. Um, theoretically, it does make sense if obstruction is a problem and expression is not really relieving uh, the meibomian the mybum obstruction, then perhaps probing, probing will be helpful. Here's another video from Steve Maskin showing a different approach. Penetrating the orifice of the two millimeter, use the four or six millimeter depending upon the length of the gland to achieve complete patency of the ductal highway. You may encounter resistance. Respecting the length of the gland will prevent extending the probe too far. Therefore, if you obtain resistance, you may be up against a fibrotic band. Check to ensure that you are collinear to the gland and then provide additional force to pop through the interductal scar. It will give way, similar to popping through a thin lacrimal punctal scar from thermal cautery. At times, you will notice a drop of heme at the orifice. This may occur as you pass through a fibrotic neovascular scar or simply a neovascular membrane. Here is an example of a plug of mybum freed up from behind a neovascular membrane. Notice the mybum being released adherent to the probe and a drop of heme at the orifice. At times, a trace amount of periglandular subconjunctival heme may be noticed from opening a membrane. Maskin describes a popping, uh, popping sensation, which, which he could feel when he introduces these probes, which I've noticed also. In fact, my technician that helps me do these at, at Rocky, AJ, even he can feel the popping sensation when I'm going through it. He's holding the eyelid for me with his finger, and I can actually feel the resistance as we're going through with the, with the probes. So, um, just an idea that may be beneficial for the future, but remains to be uh, seen whether it is uh, whether it's going to be uh, helpful. Uh, I, I yes, there there isn't. Yeah, there there is a code for a non. It's a non-reimbursed code that's used. I think it's a V code, and apparently at the the Medicare carriers, if they get enough of these V codes, will eventually decide to. So what we currently do, I I charge uh, I think two fifty or two seventy five per eye doing both upper and lower eyelid. It takes about a half hour to 40 minutes to do both eyelids and, uh, and just uh, have the patient, uh, if they want to, they need to pay for it, cash pay up front. Um, as far as anesthetic, Maskin does this with a topical lidocaine gel, generally. I, I found that about half my patients uh, will tolerate that, although there is some pain involved, and the other half require a, a block uh, of the eyelid with some xylocaine to tolerate the procedure. This is a study reported by Flugfelder's group at Arvo a couple of years ago. It's a, a laboratory study with cultured corneal epithelial cells showing, uh, apparently showing that uh, topical azithromycin or incubation with azithromycin uh, may be beneficial in decreasing uh, inflammation on the ocular surface. Um, they found that um, when these epithelial cells were uh, incubated with uh, my my microbial components, inflammatory mediators were released. However, when they added azithromycin, that blocked the release of inflammatory mediators. Here are two clinical studies, one by Gary Folks and the other by Jody Lukes, studying patients um, in the past few years with topical azocyte drops. And as you know, many people are using these as an off-label treatment of posterior blepharitis. Um, in Folks' study, he measured both the transition temperature of mybum, which is essentially the melting point, and noticed that that um, decreased, making it easier for the mybum to melt and flow out when azocyte was used for one month. He also noticed a difference in the lipid pattern approaching that of, of mybum and an increase in the tear film breakup time, which seems to <coughs> imply that azocyte might help with the mybum flow and might help with evaporative dry eye. Jody Lukes found essentially the same thing, mostly focusing though on um, symptomatology, uh, treating one group with azithromycin and warm compresses and the other just with warm compresses alone. Symptoms were better when the azocyte was used. Another approach, uh, the common approach with dry eyes, of course, is with, uh, to use artificial tears. And it makes sense to um, target our use with artificial tears depending on the particular need. For example, if someone uh, seems to have a deficient lipid layer with a short breakup time, we might want to use 
a lipid-containing product such as Refresh Endura or a product such as Sustain Balance, which is formulated for um, uh, in unstable tear film. If we're looking to replenish the aqueous layer, products such as Deritage or Refresh might be good. For glaucoma patients and other patients that have uh, significant inflammation on the surface of their eye, reducing the preservative load by using preservative free or disappearing preservatives such as found in Theratage and Gentile or ref Refresh would be good. If we want to try to reduce osmolarity, Theratage, Aquatage, and Hypotears will do that. We should keep in mind, though, that Hypotears has benzalkonium as a preservative, one of the few tears that do, so it's probably a not a good idea to use too much of that because benzalkonium is not good for the ocular surface. There are several different uh, techniques also that have been um, explained in the literature. One is saturation dosing, where an individual, if they're using uh, preservative-free artificial tears, it may have about six or eight drops in it, put a drop in each eye, and instead of throwing it away, wait a couple minutes and do it again, and wait maybe five minutes and do it again till the vial is gone putting several drops in each eye over a five or ten minute period, and that should help to, may help to decrease the frequency that the person needs to put the tears in during the day. Combo dosing is something I've used with several of my patients, and some of them will notice a benefit. If you have somebody that's use, finding they need to use artificial tears every hour, ask them instead to use <coughs> uh, cysteine gel or their tears liquid gel initially, and then about 30 mi seconds later chasing it with a regular artificial tear like Sustain, Ultra, or their tears, um, uh, regular their tears, and that will help to clear the vision that's caused by the, the gel. And many patients can go from every hour to maybe every three or four hours instead and save some time. And then preventative maintenance, rather than waiting until 8 o'clock at night when you've been on the computer for several hours and your eyes are stinging, using the eye drops before they begin to cause symptoms. <coughs> Uh, many years ago, the thought of using steroids for dry eye was considered uh, not a good idea, but nowadays it is accepted if it's used ju judiciously. Uh, Lotomax is a good drop, but rather costly, and even FML is really quite expensive. There was a study recently, I forget where, uh, I think it was last year, um, looking at uh, very dilute uh, topical dexamethasone. Instead of 0.1% using 0.01% dexamethasone, and that seemed to relieve symptoms if used even twice a day. <coughs> what about restasis? Um, topical cyclosporin, of course, has gained a lot of popularity. It's the only medication that's been approved by the FDA for use in dry eye. It's uh, an immunomodulator that acts by um, uh, suppressing the expression of um, inflammatory markers and also reducing the number of activated T lymphocytes. Its action is primarily uh, in the lacrimal gland and the ocular surface. So even though it's applied to the ocular surface, one of its main actions is remotely at the lacrimal gland because of the T lymphocyte action. So it increases aqueous production and increases goblet cell population. And, um, and Perry's study a few years ago recommended that perhaps we should consider using it in more mild to moderate cases as opposed to the severe cases because it seemed to be more efficacious. Uh, the problem is that it, most treatments are probably going to be more efficacious if you use it in the milder cases. And one of the concerns I have with uh, Restasis is that it, it costs a lot. I mean, this is the Walmart cost in Salt Lake City just a few days ago, $135. And uh, somebody has to pay for that. It, it is a good medication, but it, somebody has to pay for it. And, and the cost actually will go up to even $180, $190 per uh, a one-month supply. But restasis uh, can be very, very beneficial, especially if we're dealing with um, a, um, an inflammatory component to dry, such as Sjogren's syndrome. But not all experts in the field agree that it does any good. In fact, most patients that I ask who are on restasis, the majority, I ask them, do you think it's helping you? And most of them really can't tell me. And it, that doesn't mean it's not helping, it just means that the pathology is so complicated, there's so many factors, we really can't control for all of them. In fact, uh, when the study was done to approve Restasis, it didn't, uh, the FDA study, Restasis did not meet the primary efficacy guidelines for approval. It only met one secondary efficacy guideline, which is increasing the Schirmer test and also uh, improving symptoms in a subset of the patients. So it just barely squeaked by. Uh, but it, uh, it's the only medication that has been approved to date. 
<clears throat> in the past, I didn't pay a lot of attention to humidity, but once I moved to Salt Lake, I got a little humidity gauge. I was wondering why my eyes were bothering me so much, and so I measured the humidity and found that it was really only about 20% inside. So I got humidifiers for my house and found that I needed to put one on the furnace as well as in the room in order to get the humidity up to a reasonable level of 45%. Uh, this is a chart showing the water holding capacity of air. Now this is something we don't learn in medical school, but it's something we probably all ought to be aware of. If you look at air at zero degrees Fahrenheit, cold outside air in the winter here in Salt Lake, it holds very little water. If you bring that into your furnace and heat it up to room temperature, it will hold 16 times as much water. Now what that means is you can take this cold outside air, even if it's 100% humidity, relative of course to the temperature, bring it into the, into the house, heat it up. If you don't add water to the air, you're going to end up with less than 10% humidity. Now in practice, if you get a hygrometer and measure the humidity here, It'll generally be in the wintertime about 20 to 25 percent indoors in a commercial environment. In the, in the summertime, it's more like 35 percent. But that's one of the reasons why our patients will complain of dry eye, because the air is just very dry, which will increase um, evaporation. Uh, the other factor is that we live in a, a relatively um, high elevation here, and of course with higher elevation, the vapor pressure is um, is uh, increased relative to the atmospheric pressure, which will increase evaporation also. So here's some photos just showing room humidifiers and furnace humidifiers and hygrometers, which are inexpensive. And I have a lot of my patients uh, buy one of these because otherwise it's really hard to tell whether the humidifier is doing any good. <coughs> now, taking a turn to talk about dietary supplementation with um, um, omega fatty acids. The rationale behind taking omega-3, omega-6 fatty acids are the following. There, there has been a study showing that it may change meibomian gland oils and that tissue levels are inversely related to the severity of dry eye disease. But most importantly, the long chain omega-3s are anti-inflammatory and they tend to block the gene transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which related to the pathogenesis of Sjogren's syndrome. So if we look at the uh, metabolic cascade with omega-3s and omega-6s, um, flaxseed oil is about 50% alpha-linolenic acid, which is not, um, not anti-inflammatory, okay? Our bodies do not metabolize alpha-linolenic acid to eicosapentaenoic and docosahexaenoic acid very well. Only about 5% of that goes to eicosapentaenoic pentanoic and less than 1% to DHA in our bodies. So taking flaxseed oil is not going to do a whole lot for anti-inflammation compared to fish oil. Fish oil is much higher in EPA and DHA. <coughs> the omega-6s um, uh, will produce both anti-inflammatory DGLA as well as pro-inflammatory arachidonic acid. And so they're not as good as the omega-3s. The potential clinical benefit <coughs> of essential fatty acids are to, number one, try to restore the lipid layer of the tear film and block the inflammatory cytokines. Now, here is a, um, here's a summary of um, recent studies that were, that were done. Some are clinical studies, some, one is an epidemiologic study, and others are animal studies that um, look at um, either systemic or topical omega-6s and omega-3s. One of the problems with these studies is that most of them used either just omega-6s or a combination of omega-6s and omega-3s, but in spite of which are not as uh, anti-inflammatory as omega-3s. Nevertheless, they still, most of them found some symptomatic relief. We talked about this before, that the fish oil is actually preferred over plant sources because there's more anti-inflammatory uh, effect in EPA and DHA than there is on the omega-6 side. Now, I think this will hold true for use of these products with macular degeneration as well as uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. If you tell your patient just to go to the store and buy some fish oil, what are they going to buy? Uh, they probably should have some guidance because 
generally, if they go to most stores, a 1,000 milligram capsule of fish oil will have about 300 milligrams of total EPA DHA. But some products have much less than that, even close to 100 milligrams. And others will have um, almost 700 milligrams. Of course, Levesa, which is the prescription medication, will have, has the most, but it's also very expensive. Uh, Thorn Research is a company up in Idaho which uh, sells uh, a high quality fish oil only online. Uh, it's more expensive than the Costco variety. What I recommend for most of my patients is to go to Costco and get the 1200 milligram enteric coated which has uh, almost 700 milligrams of EPA DHA. And the cost of that is even less than Walmart. It's very, very low cost. It's the cheapest available and uh, is readily available for our patients. And so that is a good buy for um, and they make their fish oil out of uh, small fish, so the PCB and mercury contamination is probably pretty low. Now, a couple of clinical studies. This is one that was published a few months ago in Cornea, uh, oil omega-3 supplementation using fish oil. They gave a total of just one fish oil capsule per day, but it contained 750 milligrams of DHA and EPA. And they found um, that there was no difference in the mybum composition or the tear evaporation rate. So the effect of this oral fish oil didn't seem to be affecting the mybomian gland, uh, mybum composition, or the tear lipid layer, the best they could tell. What it did affect was the tear production. And another study published just this month in, in cornea using plant uh, omega-3s um, also found no difference in mybum composition. So wrapping this up, additional therapies include punctal plugs. One thing about punctal plugs, if we use them, we probably should not place them in the presence of ocular inflammation because if the ocular surface and the lip margins are inflamed, we're also making the eye retain these inflammatory mediators and debris from the inflammation along with the tears. So it's best to treat the inflammation first and then place the plug. I actually take more plugs out nowadays than, than I put in for that reason, patients coming in with symptoms and sometimes they, they do better without the plug. Lactoserts have been uh, reintroduced but are rather expensive and not, not always tolerated. Secretagogues such as oral uh, subemoline can be used uh, to s as a cholinergic agonist but that also stimulates the GI system and, and sweat glands. Autologous serum, moisture chamber spectacles and others. The moisture chamber spectacles I found to be really good. These are advertised, Seven Eyes and Wiley X are advertised in the motorcycle magazine for people who are outdoor enthusiasts uh, riding ATVs, et cetera. Quite helpful for those sports. And some of our patients, these can be purchased with uh, clear or even prescription lenses for use of our dry eye patients. I find these to be quite helpful, especially with lag ophthalmos and patients with eyelid abnormalities and neurotrophic keratopathy. Um, these will cost one or two hundred dollars. You can also go down to Walmart and get something almost as good with shooting glasses. They cost about four ninety-seven, or about five bucks, and protect the eyes really quite well from draft and may even increase the humidity. So in summary, I presented a practical clinical approach in approaching dry eye disease, taking a good history, considering lifestyle activities, focused examination, using fluorescein to examine the breakup time, effectively educating the patient, uh, keeping an eye on compliance because they often don't really comply with what we ask them to do. Uh, these are some um, environmental uh, and lifestyle factors that can have an effect. Uh, smoking, sleeping with pets, overhead fans, swimming and cycling, com long hours on the computer. <coughs> I use a handout that I develop for my patients that I, after I explain to them once or twice what I like them to do, we, we check off on the handout and give them in printed form so they can take home and digest it. And I think this will help compliance. It also gives them information where they can buy hygrometers and get humidifiers. On the horizon, they're coming up with some next generation lubricants uh, to reconstitute the mucin and lipid layer, new medications, in office measurement of tear cytokines. The current dry eye research uh, is focused on uh, mucin secretagogues, mucomimetics, and immunomodulators similar to cyclosporin and others that can help with the inflammatory problem. One of the main problems with these studies is that it's very difficult to um, pass FDA scrutiny. And uh, 
impossible really to control all the different variables. One of the challenges with the FDA approval is that um, it's impossible to control the variables. The efficacy endpoints are relatively strict. And because of all the variables, for example, how are you going to control um, what a person eats or the relative humidity in their home or how much time they spend on the computer or driving their car or other lifestyle factors and even the seasonal variations. Here in Salt Lake City, the relative humidity changing from season to season as the study progresses. Uh, you really can't control for all those things. So um, the the those who are designing the studies are looking for different endpoints and different environmental conditions that can test the effic efficacy of the medications in a, a more rapid way. So in summary, we've looked at the pathogenesis, the, the core mechanisms, the effect on the lacrimal gland and, and the eyelid, and learned that um, Inflammation is a key element in drier disease. Hyperosmolarity and instability of the tear film are principal forces. Uh, aqueous deficiency is often immune mediated. Understanding the history and lifestyle can be very helpful. A patient can have minimal symptoms and significant signs, which means that we need to always examine the patient even if they're not complaining. And punctal plug zipper use should be used after controlling inflammation. Corticosteroids are allowed and if used wisely can be tolerated and helpful to improve inflammation over a few days or weeks. Topical cyclosporin A can be very beneficial. Blepharitis needs to be controlled. Lower doses of doxycycline are often effective. Dietary supplements may or may not play a role in the future. The initial studies are not conclusive but and need to be uh, substantiated. But um, it appears that possibly oral ingestion of omega-3s may be beneficial, particularly fish oil uh, high in EPA and DHA. Uh, we can decrease economic burden by focusing on the causes of uh, dry eye disease and not being too quick to write a prescription. The ocular surface should be examined and managed pre-op, particularly with uh, refractory surgery and cataract surgery, and obtaining FDA approval for new medications is incredibly difficult, which is one of the reasons why we've had only one approved medication in the last several years. Any comments or questions? Thank you. Roger. Yeah, so the question is how do I select patients to probe? Um, um, as with any other treatment, it probably would be more effective if, if we didn't wait till the end stage. But generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll take the patients that I've treated with pretty much everything else that they will tolerate. For example, we, we have them on artificial tears, preservative free, or the on doxycycline, warm compresses, massage, lid, lid hygiene, and maybe even have tried azocyte, uh, and it just didn't seem to help, and they're still having a lot of symptoms. Then if I look at the meibomian glands and try to express them and notice that there's some obstruction, those are the patients that I'll tend to do. So it's kind of a last resort with me right now simply because they have to pay more money for it. And it, it takes some time and it's not, uh, not my favorite procedure to do, but it, it, it has helped the patients. I've been really quite impressed. I had one patient that I, I, I checked his tear breakup time before the procedure, it was, it was four seconds. And then I had him come back a week later, it was 10 seconds. And he was saying, wow, I really feel a whole lot better. And I had that, that, uh, that sign of significant difference. Just one patient, but it, uh, it seems to be beneficial. Jeff? I haven't, no.
that would be that would be nice to have those, particularly for the patients that are not able to blink and having significant cornea problems, short of doing a tarsorophy on them. Bala? Thank you. Is that uh, DHEA, is that topical or systemic? Topical, okay. <laughs> Thank you.